William! Michael, how are you? Uh, uh, I could be better. I'm plowing my fields right now and it's hard work. Hey! You're plowing your field? Yes. You know, at Foundations for Farming, we develop this way that we call climate smart farming. Climate chi? Climate smart farming. What's that? Where you don't have to plow your field. You don't have to plow? Iwe. Do you remember last season when I had a very bad harvest? And this year looks the same. Can you come around, then we'll show you. Ah, William, look, I, I, I can't come. I'm very busy right now. Mike, if you come, this will give you better yields. Better yield? Sure. Are you sure? Very sure. All, all right, I, I'm coming. Please come, Mike. Right, bye. Bye. Better not be wasting my time. I'm glad you came. Ah, thank you. I had to come. <laughs> How are you? I, I, I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? I'm very good. Good, good, good. Thank you so much for coming. Yes, I had to come and see what you're doing. Let me show you around. Yes. Ah, uh, you. This is terrible, man. It's even worse than my fields. And, and what's all this rubbish here? So that's your mouth. Gee? Mouth protecting your soil. You know, due to deforestation, plowing and burning, our soils are becoming poorer and poorer in Zimbabwe. So it's very important to put a mulch cover over your soil. And due to climate change, your soils are going to get worse and worse in the coming seasons. Uh, so you said plowing is bad for the soil. Why is it bad? Plowing is bad to your soil because it encourages soil erosion in your field, but also uh, it creates a hard pan in your soil that the roots cannot go deeper into your soil profile, and the water will struggle to infiltrate into your soil. That's why we're saying that you must put a mulch cover over your soil. Mulch? This, this is mulch? Your dead plant material, that's your mulch. Mm. Let's go to the laboratory. I'll show you something about plowing. All right. So this is your laboratory, eh? This is our laboratory. You can just look around. Yeah. This is where we do all those experiments that I've been talking to you about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, hey, hey. hey, hey technology. <laughs> Let me show you something. <laughs> Plowing can lead to many problems like compaction when the soil becomes very hard. Hard soil cannot hold the water when it rains, and so the rain cannot get deep into it. By plowing and interfering with the natural soil structure, we also stress our plants, making them weaker and more likely to get sick. Plowing contributes to massive amounts of erosion every year. Erosion wastes both soil and water. We would now like to show you that one of the primary factors influencing why we plough is in fact untrue. The belief is that if we loosen the soil, it will allow for better water infiltration. We've created two funnels. One contains fine soil, as would be seen in a ploughed field or a seedbed situation. The second contains soil which has been disturbed as little as possible after being dug from a virgin area of undisturbed soil. 
when we pour equal volumes of water onto these two funnels, it is very evident that the fine, disturbed soil does not allow for water infiltration. While in the undisturbed soil, there is very rapid infiltration. The reason why the water does not infiltrate is that the soil structure has been broken down into very fine particles. These particles actually form an impervious layer preventing water penetration and, upon drying, create a very hard, compact layer known as capping. A very visual experiment which can be conducted to show the importance of not disturbing the soil structure through ploughing is the clod demonstration. Here we take two clods of similar soil type, one from a ploughed field and the second from an undisturbed area. Visually, the clods are very different. It can be noticed that the clod from the ploughed area is definitely harder and has fewer pore spaces. When these two clods are placed into a jar of water, it is a general expectation that the harder clod will be more resilient to the water. Amazingly though, as you can see, it is quite the opposite, with the softer, easily broken clod being totally unaffected by contact with water. Thus, as we disturb soil through conventional farming practices, we are actually destroying the natural ability for soil to withstand erosion. Ploughing is not only bad for the soil structure, it also affects the crop's growth. Here we see the difference between unploughed land and ploughed land. Unploughed soil has lots of nutrients. Roots do not need to grow deep underground to find water. The crop can grow above the ground as its water needs are met. When roots rot, they leave air gaps that can hold water. Small organisms are able to coexist in perfect balance in the soil. In ploughed fields, the roots grow too large as they search for water and nutrients, and there is more crop under the ground than on top. Good organisms in the soil are killed as the ploughing destroys the structure of the soil. When it rains, water penetrates unploughed soil easily and replenishes the water table. But with ploughed land, the water does not penetrate easily and instead causes erosion. <laughs> so, I I've been doing it wrong all this time. Yes, you have. <laughs> all right. So, how does this, uh, what do you call it? Climate, Climate smart. Farming. Climate smart farming. Yes. How does that help me on my land? So climate smart farming is trying to help you as a farmer how you can adapt to the changes in climate uh, so that you can grow your crop and get the best that you can from your field. Uh, the research has been done, but it's also important for you as a farmer to do research on your area about what you need to grow in your area and how best you can grow it that will help you as well. And knowing also your soil type, uh, it will help you as well to grow the best that you can. <laughs> so, so you're saying I should build a, a laboratory on my farm, are it? <laughs> no, 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 you don't have to build a laboratory. All this research has, has already been done. So all the information we have it, we, I'll give it to you later, but it's, it's so important to know what to do and when to do it. There are certain days that needs to be kept. Mm. And I will show you on this iPad. The longest day of the year is always the 22nd of December. This never changes. The most important date for us as farmers is the 25th of November. This is the best date to plant maize to get a good crop. If you plant before this date, the plants can take advantage of the best growing conditions, the ideal amounts of sun and rainfall. If we plant after the 25th of November, we lose a huge part of our yield. This graph shows how much of our harvest we lose when we plant late. As you can see, you lose 120 kgs of grain per hectare for every day you plant late. Timeliness is so very important. So the important thing is you need to know, like with the change of climate, things are changing and seasons are sometimes unpredictable, you know. So it's very important for you to do research that will help you as well to adjust to the change of the climate. 
all right, but you are talking about this uh, 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 climate change. What is climate change? So climate change is uh, the changing of the temperatures on our globe. In some parts of the world, it's getting hotter and hotter. I'm sure last season we experienced a lot of high temperatures as well uh, that are starting to affect us. Uh, sometimes the rains come late uh, than expected. Sometimes we might have maybe heavy rains in the beginning of the season, but it just uh, less rain at the end of the season. So it's very important to make sure that everything else has been done on time to make use of that rain that you, you get as a farmer. What we do uh, as men, we are emitting a lot of greenhouse gases that are affecting our, our globe, like with our cars, our industries. There is a lot of carbon dioxide that we are uh, emitting into the atmosphere, thereby causing our globe to warm up. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you are talking about, uh, you said global, the whole world. Yeah. But how does all this affect Zimbabwe? Zimbabwe is still part of the same globe. Uh, so whatever happens in the rest of the world also affects us. So all those gases that are being emitted from our industry, from our cars, from our machinery, it's also heating up uh, the temperatures and our globe is getting warmer and warmer. You know, as a farmer, there are some things uh, that we need to change so that we can uh, adapt to the change of the, of the environment. Okay, but, but what is, I've heard this, uh, Anzichi, uh, CO3, CO, CO2. CO2, so, yeah. what, what is CO2? Yeah. So it's just the carbon dioxide that is being uh, uh, accumulated in the atmosphere. Now it's causing the temperatures to rise. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I heard about, you, you were talking about this and, and the ozone layer. Yes. And, and uh, it's, it's causing a um, uh, greenhouse effect. Yes. Yeah. Yes. W what is that greenhouse? I mean, are we all growing tomatoes? Or what? No, it's not yeah. uh, like a greenhouse like what you understand, but the same principles on a greenhouse are the same principles that happens around our globe. That there is a layer, what we call the ozone layer, mm. that is supposed to emit the, the gases that we produce. Mm. But now it's trapping those gases. Now they are just revolving around our globe and causing the temperatures to rise. Yeah, but then <laughs> I'm just a farmer. I'm, I'm just a man. There's nothing I can do about that. Actually, there's something that you can do about it. We have developed a technique uh, called climate smart farming. Some people call it conservation agriculture. Mm -hmm. But the basic is, you know what, uh, in your field, how can you uh, do the best with what you have? So it consists of things like minimum soil disturbance. You're not going to plow everywhere in your field. I'm sure you've seen how bad plowing is. Mm -hmm. Also putting a mulch cover in your field to protect your soil and to conserve your moisture as well. It is very important to do things at very high standards. Quality control is very important. And let me show you. In Foundations for Farming, we never plow. Rather, we make small holes to plant our seed in. Cover the seed with soil and ensure the soil is covered with mulch, which is a thick blanket of plant material. This means that water can travel slowly into the soil when it rains and can go much deeper. The soil will then keep moisture for much longer. The mulch reduces erosion and evaporation. Splash Demo In this demonstration, we are using two small identical plates of soil. The soil is loose as it would be if it were in a ploughed field. We cover one of the plates with a layer of mulch and then direct a strong jet of water at each plate in turn. What we see is an exaggerated effect of raindrops hitting the soil as they fall from the sky. On the exposed plate, there is a lot of soil disturbance as the soil and water is thrown out of the plate onto the paper beneath it. There is also a marked slumping or compaction evident where the water hit the soil. The other plate which had the mulch is very different and here we see how important it is to have a cover over our soil to protect it from this primary form of erosion. In order to achieve high standards, we need to pay attention to detail. It is the small things done together that make the biggest impact on improved yields. The precision of placement of planting stations, the depth of the holes we dig, the quantities of inputs we use, how many seeds we place in a hole, how deep we cover the seed, all add together to produce high standards.
Pick a line along which you can place your baseline, such as a road, fence or tree line. You must ensure that this line runs across the slope and not down it. Keep the length of the baseline to less than 50 meters. Mark out the baseline by putting a peg at each end, then tie a piece of string from one peg to the other and pull it tight to form a straight line. Measure two meters width along the baseline and place a peg. Now go up the baseline away from your peg. When you reach between 10 and 50 meters, put down another peg. Measure two meters and place another peg. Now go back down to the original peg. The working area should now be a rectangle two meters wide and less than 50 meters long. We make sure that our right angles are correct by checking with the corner of a book or a piece of paper. Uh, yeah, I, I've heard what you said, but uh, this is a lot. This is a lot. This is a lot. Really, it's a lot. It's not a lot of work. No, no, this is difficult. I mean, look at all these things that I have to remember. It might look as if it's a lot of work, but what you need to do is take it step by step. For you to be a good and effective farmer, you need to recycle everything and reuse everything that you have. You see, like when you harvest your maize, all the maize stock that are left over, you use them as mulch and they decompose to form nutrients for your next plants. So those are other things that you need to do as well. Whatever you use at a farm, make sure that you recycle it and reuse it in your, in your farm. Let me show you. If we look at nature and its processes, nothing seems to go to waste. Plants and animals die down and decay, forming food for the next generation of plants to grow on. These plants grow and are eaten by the next generation of animals. Nothing is wasted in these wonderful natural cycles. Some of the things we waste are natural elements such as water, soil, nutrients, seed and sunlight. We can also waste things like opportunities and time. Mm, yeah, this uh, recycling and reuse is very interesting, mm. but I can't use the grass, so I just burn it. No, 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 yeah. don't burn the grass. Uh, why, why not? Remember we talk about the uh, greenhouse gases that we emit in the atmosphere. Burning also causes that. You know, as you burn uh, materials or your grass, the carbon dioxide is being released into the atmosphere. From but, burning grass? Yes, from burning grass. But also that grass is very important to you as a farmer. But remember, do it in small bits or small pieces. In that way, it's more manageable and it's easy to do. Let me show you. When you prepare land for planting, your first thought might be to set fire to the weeds or to plow them under. These would be the worst things you could do. You must not burn anything but chop down the weeds with a hoe and lay them down evenly as mulch. Begin to hoe the weeds. Chop out the weeds inside the rectangle with your hose, ensuring as little soil disturbance as possible. As they are chopped out, they must be laid down and left as mulch. Once all the weeds have been chopped out of the first rectangle, make another rectangle of the same size next to the original rectangle. Begin to chop out the weeds in the new rectangular area. Simply repeat the process until the whole area has been prepared. Mulching Mulch is a covering of dead plant material on top of the soil to protect it. The best and easiest mulch in the field is the leftover residue of the crop from the previous harvest. At least 30% of the soil area should be covered by mulch, but the more the better. Mulch softens the force of falling raindrops to help reduce erosion. Mulch also slows the rainwater down, allowing it to infiltrate into the soil and reduces evaporation dramatically. So through winter, our field should remain weed-free and have as much protective blanket covering it. This ensures easy land preparation as we near the rainy season. You see now, why you mustn't burn? Mm, mulching, yeah, that's very interesting. So I'll have a good maize harvest if I do this. 
it's not, it doesn't only apply to maize. It applies to other crops like your soybeans, groundnuts, sorghum, millet, even vegetables. Mavage. Yes, it also applies. But it's very important to do research on your area and what crops to grow and how best can you grow it in your area. Look, let me show you how to plant seeds. <laughs> Prepare a 20 meter rope or string with markers every 60 centimeters. You will use this rope to measure where you will be digging the planting holes. Tie the rope to the pegs at either end of the row and dig the planting holes wherever there is a 60 centimeter marker. The holes, if fertilizer is being used, must be 8 centimeters deep and the width of a hoe. Make sure that the center of the hoe blade is exactly centered on the 60 centimeter mark. Then when you have finished the first row, remove your string with the markers forwards 75 centimeters to where the next row should be. Remember that the 75 centimeter rows run across the slope, which, along with the mulch, helps to prevent soil and water loss. Always dig the holes on the downhill side of the measuring wire, so that the soil pile is downhill of the hole. This prevents the soil from being washed back into the hole. We must try to have carefully measured row spaces with evenly measured planting holes in our fields. Straight planting rows are important because they make marking out easier and enable us to grow subsequent crops on the same rows. This method maximizes the crop stand or plant population. This improves the fertility of the soil and also reduces compaction because human feet, animal hooves and tractor wheels move in between the rows. Fertilizer and compost. Lime is an important nutrient to add to our soil. Lime neutralizes the acidic effects of the fertilizer. It is often overlooked due to difficulties in availability. Lime should be applied to the planting station at least a month prior to planting if possible, at a rate of a 5 mm cup per planting station. Dry ash from cooking fires is also very effective but needs to be used at double the rate. Fertilizer is placed in the hole using a measuring cup. Fertilizer provides food for the plant to grow. When we remove grain or produce from the field, we also remove the nutrients from the soil that the plants have used to produce the grain. The amount of fertilizer you put down should be sufficient to replace the nutrients that will be removed in the harvest. Normally we suggest a number 8 mm cup or a bottle top of fertilizer per planting station. The fertilizer should be spread carefully along the lowest point of the hole. Then a small amount of soil should be placed over the fertilizer to prevent it from burning the seed. A very good alternative to fertilizer is to put a jam tin of manure or compost into the planting station. If you use manure or compost, make the planting hole about 15 centimeters deep. It is important to note that whether you use fertilizer or an organic option, the depression left after covering should be the same in both cases. This hole is where the seed will be placed and is five centimeters deep for maize. Planting and watering. If we have done everything on time, we will have reached the point where all land preparations up to the point where we cover the fertilizer have been completed prior to the onset of the rainy season. The final task is to plant our seed. We should plant as soon after the first effective rain as possible. This chart shows you the minimum amounts of rain you need to be able to plant at a particular time. If a farmer has a water supply and wishes to plant early, it is possible to water plant. To water plant is to fill the hole with water first. A normal planting hole will probably take about two liters of water. Allow the water to soak away and then immediately put the three seeds on top of the wet soft soil. Then cover with five centimeters of drier soil and then mulch. Extra water can be added at the rate of at least one liter per week directly over the planting station. 
Seed Placement Put three seeds on top of the layer of soil directly over the fertilizer. This is the best place for the germinating seeds to be for the earliest and most efficient uptake of nutrients. Put down three seeds in each planting hole, knowing that two weeks after germination, the plants must be thinned out to two plants per station. Even with the best quality seed, there is not a 100% germination. Thus we plant 150% of what we require. This allows for losses due to animals, birds and insects. A good, full, even stand is essential to achieving a high yield. With all the difficulties of the weather, capping soils, pests, it is difficult to achieve a good even stand of maize even if you plant two seeds in each planting hole. Seed covering. This is the single most important operation that you will do as a farmer. How well you cover the seed will determine whether you have a good crop or a poor crop. We have found over the years that five centimeters of soil covering the seed is best. It is very important to cover the seeds evenly with clod-free soil and no stones. The planting stations for maize can now be covered with a thin layer of mulch, which the seed will grow through and which will keep the soil moist and prevent capping. Yeah, you know, the, 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 these uh, films are very, very interesting. You can actually learn a lot from these things. Sure. Saka, will all the seeds germinate if I use this method? Not all the seeds will germinate. Some will be eaten by birds, by rats, even if you look at your seed pack, it's written 85% germination, so there's about 15% that is not going to germinate. That's why you need to buy more. Yeah, but, but that's an expense to me. It's not an expense. Seed is your cheapest input. Mm. Let me show you. About two to three weeks after your plants germinate, you must thin the plants down to two plants per station. Try and make sure you pull the plant out with the roots. Sometimes only one seed will germinate, sometimes none. But you must still try and make sure that there is an average of two plants to each planting hole. You can do this by leaving plants in the holes on either side of the empty hole. For example, where there is only one plant in a planting hole, leave three plants in the planting hole next to it. If there are no plants in a hole, leave three on both sides. This way, you still have an average of two plants per station. Never be tempted to not thin the plants. This will give you too high a population and you will get a lower yield than if you had thinned down to two. No form of transplanting or gap filling should be done. Top dressing. Having applied our basal fertilizer before planting, we will then apply a nitrogen top dressing at about three weeks after germination. What is normally recommended is to split the top dressing with a five cup application at three weeks after germination and then a second five cup top dressing as the plants begin to tassel. This spreads the risk of leaching and loss of nutrients, especially in very wet periods. An organic option of applying chicken manure is also a good option. Chicken manure soup, which is made by hanging a bag of chicken manure in water for three weeks and then diluted 10 to 1, is very effective. This can be applied every second week for maximum reward. Place the top dressing using the cup into a hole made with a sharp stick, 10 centimeters from the plant on the upslope side. This means if there is rain, the fertilizer will be washed towards the plant rather than away from it. It would be ideal to cover the fertilizer with a little bit of soil. Stalk borer treatment. 28 days after the first rains of the season is when the stalk borer larvae will hatch. This is when the larvae are at their most vulnerable and when a treatment should be applied. A chemical treatment is very cheap and easy to apply. Usually the chemical is in granular form and a small pinch is applied to the funnel of each plant. 
This treatment can be applied any time after thinning, but preferably closer to a month after germination. Post-harvest stalk lodging is encouraged to break the life cycle of the stalk borer. If the May stalk is broken off at ground level during the harvesting process, this removes potential breeding sites. So you see, you need to do researches on pesticides because pests are other things that destroys your harvest. So you need to look at other ways, even natural ways that you can control pests. You know, I left school a long time ago. You keep saying research, research. <laughs> <laughs> Did I mention something about crop rotation? You said something before, but what, what do I have to do? I have to plant them upside down. <laughs> <laughs> it's not planting them upside down. But on your piece of land where you have planted maize, next year you must plant another crop which is not in the same family as maize, like your ground nuts, like your soya beans, so that you reduce the damage to pests and diseases. Because a pest for maize is not a pest for, for ground nuts. Let me show you on this uh, iPad. Crop rotation. Mm. Crop rotation is the practice of growing different crops in the same land to improve soil fertility. It is a vital part of conservation farming. Crop rotation increases the soil fertility because legume crops, such as beans and groundnuts, add nitrogen back into the soil. This means you are able to use less fertilizer. Crop rotation means growing one crop in a piece of land one season and the next season changing to a different crop. There are different rotations you can use. For example, you can grow maize one year, then soya beans or groundnuts the next, then maize again the following year, as in this diagram. Rotation is a very important tool that can be used to control weeds, pests and diseases. By rotating crops from different families, we are able to break the life cycles of pests and diseases. Diversifying your crop is a vital part of climate smart farming. So you need to diversify with drought resistant crops. That in case one crop fails, you have another crop that you can harvest for food or for income. Ha! <laughs> yeah, that's always a good thing, eh? <laughs> and with the extra income, I can buy more goats and, and fertilizer. <laughs> you don't have to, to buy fertilizer. Uh -uh. With recycling, you can use the resources that you have and make your own compost. Then you don't have to buy fertilizer. Oh. Yeah, let me show you in this video. Compost is a means of returning life to our soils. Materials that are normally considered waste are mixed together and are then broken down by the action of bacteria and fungi in the presence of oxygen to form an amazing alternative to fertilizer. The compost that we will be making is thermal compost and will get very hot. This heat is important as it will kill all weed seeds and pathogens. The smallest thermal compost heap should be about a 1.5 by 1.5 by 1.5 meter pile, which will ensure the compost gets hot in the center. It is also small enough for a few people to work in a few hours. It will be enough to sustain a quarter hectare of maize. Ingredients to make compost green material. Green materials are important for our compost because they contain sugars which are used to produce more bacteria. Any green material is good, even if it has already dried or contains seeds. Examples are grass, leaves and weeds. The green material should make up 40% of the total material. Dry material. The dry materials are also important for bacteria and fungi growth. Dry material should also include a percentage of sticks or woody material which allow the compost pile to breathe by giving it structure. Some good examples of dry material are maize stover, leaves, straw or grass, sticks and seed pods. The dry or brown material needs to be 40% of our total materials, but needs to consist of at least 5 to 10% of woody materials. Nitrogen. Compost needs a nitrogen source to feed the bacteria as they grow. 
there are many different nitrogen sources, but the most easily available to most people is manure. The animal dung from a kraal or an overnight pen is best, as it also has animal urine. Another common nitrogen source is the material from legumes like beans. This can be cut green like lucerne or wattle, or be dried as in bean pods or stalks. Keep your high nitrogen plant materials separate from your other plant materials to ensure you are able to mix it in the right ratios. You would need five to eight wheelbarrows of manure, depending on whether it's chicken or cattle. For legumes, you would need 20% of the total material. Water. Our compost is alive and needs a fair amount of water. Water is possibly the most limiting factor in compost production and fetching water can be difficult work. So we need to plan the placement of our compost close to a water source or to build it during the rainy season, which would mean less water would need to be carried. Oxygen. The compost needs oxygen to break down properly. We must make sure air can get inside the compost. To do this, we must avoid compacting our compost. Make sure there is some woody material in the compost, turn our compost on time, and avoid adding too much water. Microorganisms. Bacteria are the primary decomposers in our compost and generate the high temperatures. Fungi only populate the compost once it cools to less than 40 degrees Celsius and they decompose harder, woody substances. The fungus and microbes that we need are already present in the plant material. It is a good idea to use a mixture of different kinds of plant material. Planning and construction. Try to keep the different materials separate. During summer is the ideal period to begin collecting materials. At this time there is an abundance of green material which is hard to find at other times of the year. Once lots of green, dry and nitrogen materials have been collected, you are ready to begin. Arrange to get water to the site if the site is not close to water. A drum is ideal for use in drenching your materials and also helps to not waste water if it is in short supply. Make two 1.5 by 1.5 meter squares next to each other and mark the corners with pegs or poles. Take a mixture of the materials and dunk it into the water, then place it in the square where our pile is to be built. We want to get a good blend of materials as we build. Don't forget to add the high nitrogen material throughout the pile. Manures should be well mixed with water beforehand. Make sure that the sides or walls of the pile are straight and upright. Try to make a cube, not a pyramid. Continue to build the pile to the desired height of 1.5 meters. Managing temperature. Temperature is the most important factor in making good quality compost. The heat of the compost kills any weeds that were in the plant material used. Heat also kills most pests and diseases that were in the plant material. We want to keep the compost between 55 and 68 degrees Celsius. Our goal is to keep our compost at this temperature for as long as possible. After each time we turn the pile, we must monitor the temperature and ensure that it has been hot for at least three days during each cycle. All parts of the pile need to be exposed to this heat. The inside of the pile is much hotter than the outside, which is one of the reasons why turning is important. Each time you turn the pile, you should attempt to move material from the outside to the inside and vice versa. Turning the compost has three main advantages. Managing heat, getting oxygen into the pile, replenishing moisture when the pile begins to get dry. We have devised a simple method of testing and recording the temperature. 
Find a length of 10 mm round bar at least 1.2 meters long or a piece of 8 gauge wire. This rod or wire is inserted into our compost so that the end is in the center of the pile. It is left there and checked every day. When the rod is removed, be careful. If you grab the end of the rod and are not able to continue holding it, it means that we are definitely in the required zone. If the rod is very hot but you are able to hold it without letting go, then we may be just over the bottom zone of 55 degrees Celsius. If the rod is warm but not very hot, it must be somewhere between 35 and 55 degrees, so the compost is too cold. Keep simple records of your compost. Turning. When to turn. When the compost gets to the right temperature, leave it for three days and then turn it. So we turn based on temperature, not on the time, and we need to keep checking the temperature. How to turn. Begin to break the existing pile and then rebuild it in the second square, already marked by pegs. You can use a fork to loosen it up as you move to the new pile. Add more water if necessary. Do the squeeze test. As you turn, try and make sure that the outside material is moved to the inside and the inside material is moved to the outside. How often to turn? You will need to turn the pile at least seven to eight times during the process. From beginning to end, if all goes well, your compost should be ready in eight weeks. If you don't turn your compost, several things might go wrong. The compost may overheat and kill the bacteria. The compost may run out of oxygen and go bad. The compost may also run out of moisture and cool down too soon. Good compost smells good, is deep, rich brown in colour, has a crumbly texture, has visible fungal strands. The squeeze test. You can ensure compost has the right amount of water by doing the squeeze test. When you turn the compost, take a handful from the inside of the pile and squeeze it in your hand. If you see droplets of water coming out of the material, it means your compost is too moist. If you can't see water escaping through your fingers and when you open your hand the material keeps the shape that you have moulded, then the moisture is right. If when you open your hand the material falls apart, then it is too dry. Yeah, I, I like this uh, compost thing here. It means I save money and I don't have to buy fertilizer. Sure, sure. <laughs> I like that. But then, how do I control the weeds? With chemicals, yes. You don't have to use chemicals. Uh -huh. With your mouth, a blanket of mouth uh -huh. will cover any weeds that try to germinate under the mouth. Uh -huh. With your crop residue as well, uh, help you as well to control those weeds. Remember, the weeds steal moisture and nutrients out of your soil. So if you have a, a layer of mouth, it will stop uh, the weeds from, from growing underneath the mouth. Okay, but, but what if there are weeds that are already growing though? Do, do I just leave them or do I pull them out? What, what do I do? You can just pull them out by hand or you can just weed them with a hole. Oh, okay. Let me show you. Mm. We need a new way of thinking about weeds. Our weed control and land preparation must start when we harvest the previous crop. It is imperative that we keep the weeds out until the conditions are too dry for any of them to germinate. By doing this, we are already preparing our land for the next season. All we have to do is knock down our crop residue evenly and we have our mulch for the next crop. This will deter most weeds from germinating. It is tidier and neater for harvesting it also prevents late weeds from removing soil moisture and nutrients and prevents a new flush of weeds from being produced if we remove them before they set seed. After planting your next crop, look out for any early weeds 
and hoe them out as soon as you see them germinate. Weed the crop regularly. Do not let weeds grow or they will use up water and nutrients and affect the crop. It also takes less energy to hoe small weeds than larger ones and they will not have the opportunity to produce more seed, meaning that over time our weed pressure will diminish. If you are on time and do everything well and your stand is full with a good covering leaf canopy, you will only have to do four light weedings in your crop during the season. Remember, the principle of being on time is very important. <laughs> ah, these films, are they good? They're brilliant. Very useful, very, very useful. I hope they've been useful to you. Very, very, very. I, I definitely want to implement that. Ah! I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, yes, yes. I Please, did. whatever you're going to do in your field, remember to do things without plowing. Mm. Put your mulch cover in, diversify your crop so that you can get something uh, out of your land. But also do research to see what does best in your area. Research, yes, yes, yes. And please, anytime when you have any question that you need to ask, don't hesitate to come to Foundations for Farming. We'd love to help you so that you can do the best with what you have. Thank you. I, I, I definitely will. Thank I you so much. Will, I think. Thank you so much. <laughs> you must come to the house for supper. Eh? I will, yeah? Sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello, hello. Ah, where do you get such a nice crop? Eh? Ah, let me tell you. Uh, I use what's called climate smart farming. Climate smart farming. Yes. Let me explain what that is. Okay. You don't plow your field. Yes. Hmm? You don't plow it at all. Mm -hmm. All you simply do is you use mulch and manure. Compost. Compost and manure. Compost, yes, yes. Whatever you have in the house, 